My name's Louise Stewart and I'm also a Contracts Manager for With You. I'm joined by um, David Brockett from Phoenix Futures and Cat McCabe from Crossreach. And um, we're here today to talk about our partnership approach to improving pre and post rehab support in Glasgow. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about just the kind of background and why this approach we felt was needed in Glasgow. And I'm really, really pleased today to be joined by my, my colleagues who have worked together for such a long time. And I will also extend that to Trish Tracy from Turning Point Scotland, who's sitting down there with her team also. That, um, in Glasgow, we've all worked together for quite a while. And um, for the purposes of this presentation, we're going to be focusing on um, our abstinence-based residential provision in Glasgow and the community support around that, although our pre and post support also extends to crisis and stabilisation units in Glasgow also. But that's again another presentation, so we'll leave that for another day. So um, some background then. So the change in landscape um, of residential rehabil rehabilitation in Glasgow um, had a massive knock-on impact on the services we were delivering um, across the city. Um, firstly, though, pre that, um, those might be familiar with the actual changes that happened in Glasgow a few years before that, with the recommissioning of all the community services. Um, we had a number of services that were um, decommissioned to make way for three kind of all singing, all dancing recovery hubs, one in the northwest, one in the northeast, and one in the south. And um, we are with you, who were known as Ad Action at the time, had two out of three in northwest and northeast. Um, there has always been the kind of approach to, or you, you're led to believe in some ways that there's a collaborative commissioning approach or the kind of co-production model that um, out with competitive tendering, you would be really, really trying to work in partnership with your colleagues from other organisations to, to, to some success. And then it would come to competitive tendering and then everyone, the kind of co-production then kind of went and everyone went into their own organisations to really focus on that. And then when the contracts were awarded, everyone had to kind of pick it back up again almost immediately overnight and have those relationships again. And fortunately, the relationships did exist, but everyone always comes out of that process a bit bruised. Does we've experienced the services loss and all that kind of stuff too, um, services changing. And although we hugely believe in this model, we need to recognise that it, it didn't happen overnight and that there was um, some challenges across the road. But Kat will talk more about that also. Um, what we also recognised is that uh, I've worked in the community all my career, so <clears throat> that's always been my experience. And um, we work in part, we work, we try and work closely. I'm saying partners, we try and work closely with other providers, be that other community services or residential. Um, what you do then reflect on, and it's an honest observation, is that when then when you go into your own kind of model of operating within community and within residential, that you then get caught up in the day-to-day -day work. You try your best, you identify link workers, somebody will go and um, be a link worker for Phoenix, or somebody will be a link worker for, for with you from that, and then a group needs covered, or somebody's off, and then that kind of takes, kind of knocks the priority down a wee bit. So what we did recognise, and then also in, within residential services, and all very, very good intentioned, and in <coughs> the right approach, is that so focused on protecting people whenever they're in residential, making sure that they've got that place of safety. Um, so their priority at that point might not have been making sure that they were engaged with community services to kind of recognise um, the need for the kind of tie-up and the join-up. Um, also, the kind of key, what we had then recognised was that whenever you are then working as a link worker or that kind of thing, you've got another kind of core caseload as well. So people who were accessing residential rehab, um, we were missing those key points of transition, the kind of pre and then the post and um, what that looked like. And I think we know that when it comes to points of transition like that, that it's, um, it's, it's crucially important that the right support is there um, and that we also need to uh, understand that what that, um, what that kind of support looks like. We're also very, very clear that at that point of transition um, for the post part, we really, really need to hear about people who are leaving early as well in an unplanned way. So the support is for, for all. Um, what we are recognising as well now is that um, it gives people a, a real chance to get the right recovery opportunities at the right time that is needed. So although the providers of residential services and community services have got their own models, I think that the, the support that we can offer with the intensive pre and post rehab meets the person's needs at that time. And thanks to the Cora Foundation who um, funded the pre and post residential model, we're now um, just completed our second year of that and moving into uh, year three. So at that point, I'm going to pass on to Kat, who's going to talk a wee bit about the challenges that I've been facing and how we overcame them. 
Thank you. So I am going to talk a wee bit about the um, the innovation and the kind of good bits of what we've been doing. The first thing um, that we would say is, as we worked really well within this partnership, is like two honest, really challenging at times partnership working. Um, I think we've all um, spoken about like working in partnership is really difficult. Change is really difficult. Um, Louise has touched on what's been going on, what had happened in 2019 when the contracts changed in Glasgow, where David and I were pitted against each other in terms of we were the, the two rehabs in the city. Um, there was also the, the tender for the recovery hub. So there's a lot of change, a lot of stuff going on. And also people who actually needed help were overwhelmed by all the stuff that was going on. So it came a point where our two teams working together really was going to benefit people. Um, teams don't just come together. So what we what we think that our strength has become is that really true and honest and genuine, like really caring what we're doing. Um, we we don't. Let me just have it. So we've been on a journey as well. Um, we are now proper proper partners. There, were, there have been points where we've not been partners, where we've had to really thrash it out. No conversation has been off the table, because if these conversations were off the table, we wouldn't be here standing here today. Um, the rehab, um, as, as Louise mentioned, rehab is, can be quite like a bubble for folk. It's really, really good. You know, people are feel safe in it. Um, but then when they start looking at all the options, we as a staff team, aren't always great at, at showing what's what's out there. So that's where the, our partnership really, really has been has been good. Um, we people spot a fake. So if we work together and we know each other and we trust each other and we genuinely are like the same, then people see that. So if I'm phoning up when somebody's referred to me and I'm phoning up and I'm saying to we are with you, this, this guy's um, been referred to me, he's still using drugs. Um, the care manager, the statutory worker, can only actually visit him once a week, but we can't give him a bed for another two months. That's a long, you know, that's a long time. So see that, I was having that conversation, that partnership working, meeting the, visiting the person in them home, taking the person to, to visit the service. Um, at no point are we, it's both our responsibilities. We can't be We can't be saying anybody's to blame if something goes wrong. It genuinely is like we genuinely have to um, believe in what we're doing. And teams see the benefit of this. So our teams have, have gelled, have now we're embedded um, in each other's teams. One of the good things that we've done is that co-location. So we will work in the We Are With You buildings and they will come into our buildings and be present. And that just naturally means that that connection happens. So human, you know, human beings, human relations ha relationships happen, and we naturally have conversations about people, um, and we're less of a bubble, um, both for the people that are in the service and also for for ourselves as teams. Um, the rehab staff know that if they can't contact a referral, so somebody's on the referral. In the past, what would happen is if the, if the worker, if the addiction worker couldn't find that person, that person would just not get rehab. Whereas now, we have that conversation with We Are With You, and then they go and visit that person. We actively try and seek that person. We'll keep phoning them. Um, and we know that we obviously the care manager, the statutory worker is, is you know trying as well. Then also it's helpful if, um, if the risk because if medics assess that the risk is really high, um, but no one can visit that person if they're still using, then we again have that conversation and we can actively be speaking to them, bringing them along to the service, answering all these questions that they may have, um, offering practical help. And a key part of what we're doing is that lived experience recruitment and use, working alongside lived ex people who have lived experience or our living experience of rehab. Um, the, our main recruitment sources are the SDF traineeship. Elevate is a local Glasgow partnership, so they have a traineeship as well. So we, we kind of have a, a follow on from both of these pathways. And as you know yourselves, if you've ever had anyone in placement, they're always, you know, it's always a great, it's great to see people develop and then, you know, follow on and become um, part of our teams. We also, because not all these people will have had rehab, rehab actually lived rehab. Um, 
We also recruit from both our, our internal, so both Phoenix and Crossreach have their own volunteer programmes. And as, um, as you know, like that, once you leave rehab, it's that bubble, you're going, you know, that safety bubble is gone, that safety net is gone, so you're going out into the community home or to a move on service or wherever you're going, having something to do is beyond essential, you know. So people, it's like our form of, of aftercare as well, but it's just, um, so these people who work with um, our teams, they'll be able to say to somebody, okay, on day one in rehab, you, you, you know, you're tested, your urine's tested, um, your bags are searched, um, you'll be shown your room, this is what your room smells like, this is what your room looks like, watch out for that staff member. You know, just the genuine stuff that people need to know, people care about these things, um, because they're absolutely terrified. Imagine, in our case, it's three months, um, so we're at the abstinence ends of recovery, but imagine taking three months out of your life, like, that's a big commitment. So um, we just want it to be as smooth as possible and we believe that our partnership through you know that genuine kind of proper partnership working putting all the nonsense to the side and just focusing on the person is how we're doing it well um co-locating within each other's teams is really important for that and just that lived experience peer working alongside us is um making this a successful partnership thank you this is Jay's journey, but actually what I want you to do is think about uh, somebody that you know that's been in uh, rehab. Um, it might be a colleague. It might be somebody sitting at the same table as you. Um, it might even be yourself. Um, and what we... And additionally, um, it may be somebody that has been in rehab and that didn't work for them. And with that, we need to recognise then as residential rehabs in Scotland, what can we do that is better? You know, what is it that we need to do to address, you know, the, the, particularly the people who, who come in and it doesn't work for them? We, um, two or three years ago, if a referral came into Phoenix, we probably, and the funding was confirmed, we probably had them in the next week. Um, nowadays, we've got a admissions board with 45 people on it. Um, with that, that means that we might need to work with somebody for three, four, five months prior to coming in. Um, that's difficult. Um, we don't have the, the resource necessarily, however the resource is there. The pre and post um, rehab workers, um, for we are with you, but also for both our services, are vital. They'll be working with people at that very early stage prior to coming in. For Jay here, this looked like it could have been four, five, six weeks prior to coming in, able to attend um, groups if that was on offer and if it was appropriate. It could be um, through phone calls, it could be face-to-face -face contact, but additionally, it will be about um, being able to answer those questions that people have. Driving up here um, from Glasgow took three hours, but anyway... Um, <laughs> South Ayrshire's, is it South Ayrshire? Louise doesn't know this, so the, the, Matthew phoned me, and he's part of the Rhodes team, and he asked a very um, personal question for an individual who was referred to us about medication. And I was saying to Matthew, right, I'm fine, I've got plenty of time here, <laughs> I'm in a traffic jam, so I'll speak to you. And I was able to answer that, or at least give an answer, but what I thought was fantastic was that was a voice for somebody that wouldn't be able to... They would have came in on day one and then probably been a bit overwhelmed by the, the response they would get from a doctor or from a worker or even a peer. And actually, this person was able to get an answer. So they had that voice prior to coming in. I thought that was huge. Um, and that's something that we're experiencing and we're doing now in partnership. I'll take you to the middle part here um, for Jay. Jay's a 28-year-old female um, going into a cross-reach, ended up doing a 14-week um, programme. We work with people, it's three, three months, maybe up to six months. We're looking to do an awful lot of work. If you just look there, there's criminal justice, there's family, there's housing, there's health. Um, you know, there's loads of stuff there in a very short period of time. Um, and we're looking at people going through a process of change in a very, very short period of time. So actually, what can we do? We need time. We need relationships. We need connection. 
So we make that time longer. Okay, so we support them prior to coming in and we look at the post. You know, and that's vital. And it means that we've got that connection with people for a longer period of time. You know, so they'll have a better chance and they'll have more connections. Um, ultimately, um, Jay was able to move into a support accommodation um, with Crossreach, you know, and continues to do well. So that, that's really vital that we've got that connection beforehand, but we can also support after. Okay, thanks. So um, finally then, for myself, as we're looking at what is next, um, we are noticing an increase in demand for pre and post residential rehabilitation support that goes hand in hand with an increase in demand for residential rehab placements. So we will be doing everything that we can to ensure sustainable support is there and that um, we'd be seeking to for um, longer term investment to allow us to progress with that. As David mentioned, South Ayrshire, and it is a good point, it's a good time to reflect that there is very similar models happening across the uh, across the country here in Dundee as well. There is um, pre and post rehab pathways also and um, Lee and Laurie and that team are also benefiting from the partnerships that are happening within the Glasgow residential services also and they've been down and, and shadowed and spent some time with the guys down here. There's a network happening across the country which is really, really important. We know that there's also in areas where maybe we're not delivering services there is other services that are offering this, and we like, for example, South Lanarkshire or, or Fife. So it is good to kind of get to know what's happening in areas where this is being delivered, but also um, areas where it's not. And I'm trying to kind of replicate um, because we know the success of it and how important it is. Uh, the other thing around increased involvement from third sector and decision making. Um, for residential funding and we know that that's been a challenge we know some areas are further ahead than others for example there's a really really good model um, happening at Gail and Butte um, and also other areas across the country it's only very very recently that we've been involved in a decision making panel in Glasgow although we have been operating there for such a long time and um, so that's very welcome and um, we currently we've got an evaluation an external evaluation going on at the moment and we're hopeful that that a report will be published in December, and as soon as that's published, we'll be able to share that widely um, with anyone who would like to see it. Um, that there's a quote there that's um, that ends the presentation, but just before that, I can give you an idea of some of the numbers that we were seeing in Glasgow over the last two years' delivery um, with the pre and post rehab, specifically for the abstinence-based um, residential rehabs cross reach in Phoenix. We've worked with just over 150 people. Um, almost 60% of them um, we were able to they were moving on um, treatment complete discharge with really, really good strong positive outcomes um, another number of people 30% of people that were then re-engaged with different services who could meet their specific needs moving forward whether that's care and treatment services or longer term recovery hubs um, and then there was another 10% that, um, that disengaged. But we are quite proud of those um, outcomes that we're receiving. And, and what we're, we're also kind of thinking about is how we, how we measure that of value across all of our services so that we are with you, aren't we reporting this way, or Phoenix, or Crossreach, or that kind of thing, how we can get a kind of unified or united approach to that so we can really, really show um, where this has worked well. And also, both we've all kind of touched on it where it doesn't where residential rehab hasn't been the the right path for someone but they've been on the pathway and then what that looks like also and how that's also a success for someone because ultimately it's that person that's that's measuring their own it's very um, person centered and a lot of the time well some of the time people will come into the pathway thinking that residential is for them and then through the intensive support will realize that it's not um the kind of average time that someone's open to us for the intensive support is about six months and that's that 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 what that looks like in practice is approximately three um one to one sessions a week we also do some group work programs as well um, so the quote at the end is i've been in rehab before but having the same workers before and after going in made leaving less stressful i got support to go and tidy my house before i left rehab and my worker came with me to medical appointments and encouraged me to attend fellowship and recovery cafes and um, people might think that that sounds quite simple, but sometimes the simple is the best, it's most effective, and that's what made a difference for that person. So thank you very much for listening to us, and thanks for allowing us to come and present today.